Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hey, this is Bree Noble and welcome to the podcast. I am excited to be here with David Craver from the Open Mic Network. And I'm really excited to talk about this because I met David a few weeks ago and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get this information out to our listeners and the people watching the podcast because I'm always saying to my students and anybody that asks like, you know, where can I get some good practice before I like start try to book gigs and stuff like that? And I'm like, oh, open mics are so great for that. Um, and a lot of people don't know where to find them. So this is going to be a really good conversation. But first, before we get into that, I would love to have you, uh, David, just let everybody know, you know, kind of your backstory. Like, I know you're a musician. So how did you get involved in music? What made you decide to start the Open Mic Network, which is has become a really big, big thing? So, how did that all start? Well, uh, I would be more than happy to share my uh, my little story. And and Bree, thank you so much for having me on the podcast, mm-hmm. not just a podcast. And um, so, I got into musical family. My father was a star on Broadway in the 50s. My mother was on the Perry Como show for six years as a uh, as a singer. So, uh, you know, the New York thing, and they were both professional uh, entertainers their whole life. That's what they did. My mom ended up, uh, after she left television, was a, a vocal coach for 40 years. So you would think that that would just shove me right into being a professional musician. No, no. Um, I, I stumbled onto guitar uh, at 18 and played in the backyard like everybody else. And then at 35, I had some life-changing things and um, some people I was living with left, like my wife. And, and it opened up some time uh, and I started playing at an open mic. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I, there's people and they, we are, we're all kind of like-minded and we can play the same songs. And I was just having the time of my life. Uh, that ran from the summer because it was an outdoor thing at a coffee shop. And I was driving 30, 40 minutes to get to the thing. And I showed up one day and it was cold. And they said, oh, we've, we're not doing it anymore. It's done. I'm like, no, 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 no. What do we do? And so I, I immediately, the next day um, here in Georgia, I, I went, you know, the, the closest uh, uh, bar to my house and said, um, hey, I need to run an open mic and it needs to be here. And I want to do it on Tuesday. And the British guy looked at me and he said one thing he goes, well, what if you suck? <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, I, I got an answer. And I went and got a cassette out of my car and I handed it to him. I said, this is me playing some songs. And if I suck, don't call. OK, just I don't need I don't need the feedback. If, if you don't like me, just don't. And I hadn't played out anywhere. All I had done is attended an open mic and all I wanted to do was run an open mic. And he said, well, you don't suck. Come on back. And so I ran an open mic for like three years, just every Tuesday. It was wildly successful. And and I was just having the time of my life because I had a, a, a day job. And then um, at the same time, I lost the day job and the, the they sold the bar and I didn't have anything. I had no income at all. And then uh, the weirdest thing ever, if you ever worked with restaurants or bar owners, they're not real outgoing. You have to go to them to get them to do anything. I had three bars, three bar owners within two days call me and say, hey, we hear you're not doing that open mic anymore. Why don't you come over here and do it? And I'm like, whoa. So I'm like, okay. So I doubled the price and I said, I'll do you Monday, you Tuesday, you Wednesday. And all of a sudden I'm like, this could be a business. I, I'm making more money now, you know, and, and it, it just, well, you know, I, I wasn't killing it, but I, I could pay the mortgage. So all of a sudden I started thinking about open mics as a business. And from that, I grew um, Open Mic Atlanta. 
and then um, decided that if it could work here, I could do it, you know, in drivable cities. So I did it in Charlotte and Birmingham. And when I say do it, we had um, at one point, I think we had 40 uh, live music open mics running in the in the three cities. And I had free commercials on the local classic rock station by putting together a deal where we would promote Budweiser in the bars for free if they would buy more radio spots. And that that buy that I orchestrated gave me free spots. And then I went to the bars and said, if you bring in our open mic, then you get to have your bar mentioned in commercials on the radio. And they're like, oh, I said, you know what it costs at radio spots? He goes, yeah. I said, well, all you got to do is give me 200 bucks and for an open mic and you get free radio spots. The guy's like, oh, so it wasn't really hard to sell the bar owners. And then that kind of uh, blew up. And then we decided to try another model where we um, basically we have 85 markets and we have the domain name, openmiccitynamecom in all of those, instead of just having one domain and you just come and choose your city, right? So we have openmicnewyork.com. We have openmicboston, Chicago, LA, Miami, you name it, Orange County. <laughs> and um, so- you know, uh, with, I, I'm guessing you don't have open mic Rancho Cucamonga, California.com. <laughs> oh my gosh, I do. I just got it last week. All right. Or ESPN <laughs> or something. This is great. <laughs> no, uh, San Diego. Ah. Um, so, or, um, yeah, it's all Inland about, Empire, maybe, but that's yeah. in, right, 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 right. I know it well. I, I, I drive through the Inland Empire to get to my friend's uh, house up in the mountains there. So, <laughs> Um, so it, we, we got all these domains and I started letting everybody in the world, uh, promote their own open mics on our websites. So if you had a, an open mic in San Diego, you could just go on to openmicsandiego.com, submit all your information and you're on there for free. And with that, I got lots and lots of people coming to these websites looking for open mics. And then from that, I ended up, um, they would would say i want to be in you know in inside the tribe i want to i want to join the open mic network and so i've got um, about eighty thousand musicians on our email list that are you know avid musician hobbyists and uh, people that use open mics for a wide variety of things but uh, they're all in our little little world and and that's how i came to be the grand poobah of all things open mic <laughs> that's so smart and it and it grows like in my opinion, like most good businesses, like you saw a need, you filled it, you know, or you, for, first it was you, you were interested in it. Then you saw a need, then you got scrappy, you figured out how to, you know, do the whole thing with the radio ads, which was super smart. And then you're like, oh, there's got to be a need for this other places. You expanded like this is how any good business starts, I think. Um, and so what is your business model? Like, I'm curious, how how do you actually make money with the network. Sure. So everything we do for musicians and hosts, people that run open mics is free. So um, I, I, I front all the cost of, of hosting 85 websites and, and uh, having a, you know, a, a robust email service. And we have, you know, we pay a fees for a jot form so that people can sign up in advance for the open mics and all, all these things cost money. So in order to offset that cost and hopefully make a couple of shekels in profit, which is what business is all about, because I do like to occasionally have a meal. Yes. Um, <laughs> crazy that way I like to eat. So um, there's uh, two main things. One is because we have uh, so many musicians coming to our websites, we have eyeballs. And so um, we uh, combine banner ads and ads on, uh, we also have an app, which I'll tell you about, uh, and then email blasts, and then we sell sponsorship. So uh, I've been fortunate. We've worked with probably 20 different major music gear uh, companies and currently work with um, Taylor Guitars, Electra Voice, and um, the Berkeley School of uh, College of Music. And uh, those are sponsors. So they pay a sponsor fee, and we promote their products and programs. Um, the other thing is, uh, because we have 80,000 musicians that um, came to us because they want more information about open mics, 
we have uh, the ability to send an email just to a particular market. So, um, so you know, we've been working with a number of, of venues across the country that see the value of putting an email in the inbox of an active musician hobbyist that is in their market. So we, for $25 a week, we'll send an email out to uh, the 3,000 musicians in Boston telling them to come to your open mic. Nobody else's because nobody else is paying. Unless, you know, if there's two or three, well, then be two or three. But, uh, you know, there's 3,000 people. So that's a great deal for them, honestly. Wow. Yeah, 25 bucks a week. And it takes, you know, really one person walking through the door that buys, you know, dinner and a drink to, to cover the cost. So it consistently, it just works. Because when somebody gets in, it's like, oh, you know, I didn't know about that open mic. Or, oh, I forgot. You know, it's just that reminder. And it's it's a good deal. So you know, between the sponsorship and then the um, the program we call Open Mic Pro uh, at twenty five dollars a week, we we make enough money to to float the boat. That's really smart. So you know, I'm interested in the fact that when you started, you would go to restaurant owner, bar owner, and say, "I'll run this open mic for X amount per week." Like as a musician, I didn't even realize there were people that did that. I thought that it just had to be like the restaurant owner had to just decide to like have this. But when you think about it, it's like, well, there's a lot involved with an, setting up an open mic. And it makes sense that there'd have to be like a third party that knew what they were doing to have that. Like what what made you think to even create that, offer that? And I'm assuming all these places all over the country that you're promoting, there's some middleman, middle person that's setting these things up for the restaurants. Right. It was through experience. It was just literally going to that one open mic and talking to the host. And he was getting $50 and uh, running running this thing. And he would just bring out one little, it was a very small time gig. Like I said, it was outside. If it was raining, we couldn't do it. And he would just show up with one little speaker. We'd sit there and he had a little uh, sign up sheet. Then and people would walk up and sign up. And, and, and I said, dude, do they pay you to do this? He goes, yeah, they give me 50 bucks and I get to eat, you know. Like, okay. So when I went to do it on my own, I thought $50 isn't it. I said, I, I, I you know, I, when I, when the guy said I didn't suck, I said, well, good. It's uh, $150. He goes, okay. And then when I went, when the other places actually called me, I think I said it was $250, you know, and they all said, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the same formula you use when you play out as, as a solo acoustic artist or a band is that your job is really not to to make music uh, on the business front. Your job is to sell beer. Mm-hmm. And musicians hate that. It's like, I'm not a beer salesman. Well, yes, you are. You're, you're, you're the one, you're the reason. You either bring people in because they know you and love you, or if they have people there, you keep them because they love your music and you, you cement them to the chair so they buy more music. And that's the same thing with an open mic, is we have to, if, if I show up and two people show up to play, you know, it, great. We all get lots of time to play, but the bar is not making any money. And and that's when they, they show you the door and you got to leave. And that's why the way I do open mics, it starts with having the host and the sound system and, you know, offering advanced sign up and all these, these other things so that you, I, I study other people's open mics and eliminate all the parts that suck mm-hmm. <laughs> and keep the parts that, that I think are great. And so from that, we've, um, been able to create something that uh, musicians like, and then we we do the marketing. So we you know we send out that email, we put it on the website. We have uh, forty Facebook pages that correspond um, through for open mics in all the major markets in the U.S. And so we do a lot of promotion. We make events on Facebook, and we 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 drive things so that when we you know say we're going to come in and have a host, and we're going to bring in the people, all you need to do is open the doors and treat them nice. It's easy for a, a venue owner to to digest that this could possibly work, and it it really falls in the same category. Uh, where it's called an on premise promotion. So on premise promotion is a is an umbrella term for anything that a venue would pay a third party for to come in to generate business on a given night. And so that's live music, that's karaoke, that's open mic trivia, mm. uh, bar bingo. Any, any of that is on-premise promotion. We're all in the same game. We're all selling beer in a venue, right? So I'd be remiss if I didn't back up a little bit. I forgot about, I mean, the really, <laughs> the main way 
that we continue to make money, the most money we make is actually operating the open mics. Because yeah, that's I, what I wanted to know. Are you right. are all these people that are doing the open mics people that you've trained and they do your system or do they apply somehow to, you know, be in your network? Right. So um, the vast majority of the open mics on our websites are just people doing it on their own. And so it's a you would have and typically a, 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 an open mic host would be a musician that's uh, a, a music teacher. Uh, somebody that plays out solo, somebody who plays in a band, somebody that does maybe some online teaching, uh, in-person teaching, and they have, you know, Sunday through Thursday nights are wide open. And so they, they you know, they go to a place close by home and they say to the, the venue, hey, you know, I want to run an open mic, right? Or they, you know, maybe they, they've been in the open mic world and, you know, somewhere else. And that, you know, once you're in it and you, you see how all the moving parts work and you know how money changes hands, is it's pretty easy. And so I think we have 1,800 open mic hosts in a separate okay. database. So what I did was, so the, word, the term open mic, unfortunately, can mean three things. And a lot of, a lot of open mics will, will say we, we, we welcome anybody, like at a coffee shop in a progressive area, right? It, it's, <laughs> let's say there's a bunch of hippies at a coffee shop. And, um, you know, we, we welcome poetry and we welcome comedy. That's what I was wondering if you had, we welcome music. Word. Nope, nope, nope. And nope. So, you know, that's the thing is uh, Taylor really doesn't care about reaching spoken word poets. And uh, Evie doesn't really care about reaching comedians. They want to reach musicians, so and I want to reach musicians. Yeah, you think so, about that, we, that that scene in uh, "So I Married an Axe Murderer," where he's doing the spoken poetry in San Francisco or whatever. And I was thinking about that. So that's not what you guys. You're only music, just music, live music. Open mics is what we are, and to that end, I change the name of open mics. I call them micro music festivals. Oh, ah, that right. sounds We're much open. more upscale. Micro, okay, that's like a microbrewery, and everybody loves microbreweries. Mm -hmm. Festival, who doesn't like a music festival, right? Everybody loves the music. And so you have a micro music festival. Mm -hmm. And so what is a music festival? I mean, you're going to have multiple acts. You're going to have food and booze. You buy a ticket, come in. Everybody's, you know, and it's all kind of, you know, everybody knows what a festival is. Well, if you just shrink it on down and you think about what is an open mic? Well, you have multiple acts. You have food and booze. <laughs> it, it really, it is, it is a more befitting name than open mic. And I have people tell me, ask me all the time. Oh, oh, okay. I get it. And I explain it like that. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but I have one question. Yeah. How are micro music festivals different than open mics? I said, they have a better name. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, how are they different? <laughs> I said, dude, they have a better name. That's it. They're, they're, it's the same, okay? We just don't, there's, there's nothing about a music festival that says comedy or, or, or uh, poetry, right? right? So it's all music. So that's, that's how I do that. So I run a bunch of micro music festivals. So if a venue contacts me in Chicago and wants to have, they're like, oh, I saw your website. You know, we were thinking about setting one of these up, but we really don't know how to do it. And I said, well, you know, we either can, you know, we can promote you for free. Or if you want to find a host and, and do all that, we'll, we'll uh, for 25 bucks a week, we'll do a lot of promotion for you. Or for say uh, $250 a week, we'll do everything. So we're going to send in the host. We're going to do all the promotion. It's turnkey. You don't have to worry about it. And you get to use the term micro music festival because I don't know if I mentioned it. It is copyrighted. Very smart. Thank you. Um, so micro music festival for the use of exactly what we've talked about is prohibited unless you're working with me. Got it. So restaurants and bars can contact you and say, hey, this looks cool. We have no idea how to do this. Can you just provide us someone to do it? Mm -hmm. And what I do is I go into my database of 1,800 uh, open mic hosts that are either current or past hosts and say to, you know, maybe I've got 10 in Chicago and I send a note to everybody. Hey, this is the location. This is the thing. This is the opportunity. This is the pay. Bah, 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 bah. Anybody interested? You know, and three people say, yeah, I'm interested. I've got nothing going on Tuesday. 
And then I talk to each one and find out which one would be the best fit and uh, basically curate the, the, the host down to um, the one. And then the person becomes the, the person that shows up, feet on the street, runs the thing. And then we drive the marketing um, from uh, high atop the hill overlooking Lake Lanier in uh, Oakwood, Georgia. I love this because first of all, like, you know, when I was thinking about open mics, I'm like, oh, this is such a great opportunity for musicians and stuff. But it really is an opportunity for another income stream for, like you said, people that are, you know, teaching during the day. Maybe they're teaching uh, music in a junior high school or, you know, or they're a choir teacher or whatever. Or they're teaching voice lessons and they've got evenings free, mm -hmm. right? That's really, really smart. It's just another stream of income. Also, if you've got a lot of connection with a lot of musicians that want a place to, you know, showcase what they're doing um, you're a teacher, outside of a recital, you, you know. I One of the things that we do um, when we hook up with a, a venue in a particular place is if, if it if the venue lends itself to that. So I, another thing I've been doing lately is um, doing micro music festivals with municipalities. So there is this trend across the country where practically every little town, especially in the suburbs around major cities, like here in Atlanta, there's you know Duluth and Swanee and Gainesville and all the Alpharetta, all these places that people in the other part of the country never heard of, but they're thriving cities under themselves they they all have a town square they all have um you know this thriving restaurant bar scene and the cities have said the best way to support that scene is to bring in live music mm -hmm. and they are doing like i played so i play out i play cover songs and things and uh the city of duluth just down the road um had two people playing simultaneously for three days straight during a an arts festival and the city pays the, the the performer. And so instead of in that situation, I say to them, instead of having one performer, why don't you have hire me and I'll bring in a micro music festival. And that way, instead of it's just being here's one performer and everybody is consuming the music, we'll have 10 performers. And so and those people will reach out to people they know and bring actually bring more people to the festival. Right. So see butts and seats, heads and beds. And also it's inclusive. So we'll reach out to the local community and the local musicians that live there can actually take the stage and participate in the entertainment process as opposed to just consuming. it. So that, um, that's getting a lot of traction. We're actually um, in the little town up here in Gainesville. They have a beautiful little square. And every Wednesday in July from seven to nine, I'm actually hosting it because close to home. Uh, but I'm doing the um, uh, Gainesville Micro Music Festival, mm -hmm. and we have I put it out there to the the three thousand or so musicians on the Atlanta list, and said if you're interested, send a demo. And I curated the list, and we've filled up everything for uh, it's actually five Wednesdays in July, and it's all all full already and ready to go. That's super cool. So that brings up my next question, because when you walked into that bar a long time ago with your cassette and he's like, how do I know that you don't suck? I think there's this idea about open mics that it's just anybody that's there and all you have to do is put your name on the list and you could really suck. So how do you if you're going to call it a micro music festival, do you really audition everybody in advance? It depends. It's that's it's a negotiable item with the um, the venue or wh whoever we're working with. Like we work with um, Aspire Healthy Energy Drinks, marketed to women. It's like uh, Red Bull Light. Yeah. So um, and it's all natural, very healthy, good stuff. And they'll do samplings and hand out, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a run for breast cancer. Obviously, it's going to be full of women, and they set up a little table and they do sampling. At the, at the finish line, they hand everybody a drink and they want to have a micro, the Aspire Micro Music Festival playing next to the booth so that there's this energy and uh, the name Aspire goes a long way with aspiring artists. Mm -hmm. And so um, we curate that. Hey, who wants to play? It's going to be a lot of people. It's a big deal. You know, it's no pay, but it's a good way to go. And so we, we curate those. Um, some venues are like, you know, I, I don't want anybody on stage that sucks. Okay. So yeah, if you want it, we have it's and, and because it's a micro music festival, it's easily digestible by musicians to say, oh, well, of course I have to apply. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, when was the last time you 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 went to Lollapalooza and walked up right. on stage and, and yeah, hey, I'm Dave. Yep. <laughs> so it's a micro music festival. So yeah, that so we when we run them, we do tend to curate them. Like I said, everything uh, there in, in the municipalities, they want to make sure that you know it's it's kid friendly, it's quality music. So we, but we have a crazy variety and we have country guys, we have cowboy guys, we have, we have jazz and, 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 uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're all over the board, but uh, everybody's pretty good. Yeah, that makes sense. And so what about, um, it, what if the musicians aren't amateurs? What if they actually have like merch that they want to put out and, and they want to give out their cards or collect email people to, do, do you allow that? Yeah, we we allow we encourage it. So uh, it kind of touches on the point of the there just the topic of there are multiple uses for an open mic. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a one dimensional thing where just amateurs come up and play. It starts with that. So you have amateurs, but you say amateurs. It's you have a lot of people that used to play music as a kid. And then they realize they're not going to make a living in music. And so they go get jobs and then they get married and they have kids and then they pop out the other end, you know, in their forties and they've got time on their hands and the guitar sitting in the corner, you know, that's their, they, they play with a friend and that friend says, Hey, uh, there's a, there's this bar up here and they got an open mic. We should go up there. And they walk through the door and they just have the time of their life because mm -hmm. it's not, they go in to play music, but what they do is they realize that it's, it's a whole uh, social scene. And one of the hardest things to do as an adult is make new friends, right? Because everybody's so busy and stuff. You, know, you make friends when you're kids and you kind of stay in touch all your life. And most people have friends for life from when they're kids uh, and, and very few friends that they made, you know, once they got right. out of college. Especially if you move away like me, like, right. I, you know, I have a couple friends for life, but I don't see them. Yeah. Oh, I did. Like with some of my friends in California, I've known since high school. But uh, I, I was the number like I hosted an open mic uh, locally here uh, for 16 years every Wednesday night. So if you think an open mic can have legs, I'm living proof. Um, and it was, you know, I probably 20 people marriages occurred. Oh. People met at my open mic. Musicians that were there, and it's girls came in. Next thing you know, they're talking. And next thing you know, they're having babies. I'm being invited to weddings. It's crazy. I, I, I've had I've, weddings and then those people get divorced and then the mm -hmm. guy gets married again. I mean, all, 16 years is a long time. That's and, true. And uh, I would say like on the on the female side, as far as like, why would people come to open mics later in life? I mean, a lot of women, myself included, like you get busy having kids or whatever. You You can't go out there and perform. Maybe you used to perform before that or you know, you found that you can really work through some issues in your life by writing music or whatever. Um, but then you haven't had a lot of experience performing. You want to just get out there and sing your songs and see what people think of them. You know, that's a, a time when people can start going to open mics. What are the, do you allow um, original music or is it all covers or mixes? Oh, absolutely. Matter okay. of fact, some some of the uh, venues we're in don't want to pay the, um, the PRO mm. fee. Right. Right. The ASCAP and BMI. And so they, the only music that they ever book in there is original music mm. because that's how you get around it because they're, they're, they're not beholden to anybody. Right. That um, brings up a good point. Like, do you deal with that to make sure that they're actually paying? Do they, are you the middleman for collecting that or do they have to, you have to make sure that they've applied? Or is that kind of on them that they're paying for their cover fees? Totally on the venue. Musicians are not required to pay licensing right. fees to play cover songs, but the venues in which you perform are required. For sure. But you don't know that they're really doing that. I mean, you don't know, don't care. Them. Right. Totally. It's that's up to them. Yeah. That's if, if they want to fight the fight and potentially, you know, it will be gladly. I, and I know absolutely we've been in venues that um, refuse to play the uh, PROs and we do cover songs and, you know, nothing ever happened. And mm. But and the could, musicians can report that too. I played here, I played there. And, you know, then that yep. could let the, you know, let the PRO know that the venue is not complying. Well, it's really easy. It's it's hard to hide if you're a venue and doing live music, because the whole point of what we do is to promote the fact that we're doing open mics at a venue. Mm -hmm. And so if, if right. the PRO just ever found the open mic network, it would be just like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's see that one. They're doing they're doing an open mic on Tuesday night. Send in the hounds. Oh, and they did send somebody in and they'll sit there and they'll record it. You know, like we have proof that you're doing cover songs. So but we are uh, completely uh, on board with if they want to do all original, then we can do that. Most open mics are originals, um, covers, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, like say you have musicians that rediscover the joy of making music. I, I, I've got a, a saying that I like. It's um, hearing music touches the heart, but making music touches the soul. Mm. And so if you are if you have the ability to make music, you need to go out and do that. And, and doing that with other people elevates it exponentially. So you, you get this social thing and it, it's a real, it's a tangible thing. And it's easy to make friends because you're all doing the same thing and you're jazz. It doesn't, you know, this guy's a lawyer and this guy works at a gas station, but they're, they're, they're bonding over music and they become real friends, you know, and, and you just never, the lawyer would have pulled in and got gas and talked to the guy for 10 seconds and, and moved on. But now they've got this, this common point. So the, the social aspect, also the, the, um, just the the expression because uh, music obviously is art, and so artists need to express themselves. So uh, an open mic stage is is that for so many people. You mentioned professionals. The one thing I think is used the least amount, least frequently, is in that arena where you've got people that are professional. They're they're maybe they're solo acoustic, and they're they're trying to uh, you know bust it in in the modern day. And that's done through social media and booking gigs and uh, networking and all that good stuff. So you bu build an audience online and then go someplace where that audience is and sell tickets. That's how you make money because nobody's buying music. So let, let's say you come to Atlanta and you, you, you're you going to play at Eddie's Attic. Um, you've got a gig on Thursday. You know, why don't you come in a couple days early and then map out all the open mics mm -hmm. in advance of the show? And then you're actually promoting the show on Thursday, on Tuesday and Wednesday, and people hear you and they, and they meet you and they talk to you. And now you're friends. And then you could say, you should come to my show. You'd be surprised how many people will just say, well, yeah, I'll come to Eddie's on Thursday and watch your show. And they, you know, and next thing you know, they become, that's how you get real fans in the real world. So you use the open mic as a way to collect emails touch points, invite people to shows, let them hear your music firsthand live. Yeah, you're not getting paid, but you're actually, what you're doing is you're, you're paying a fee for marketing and that's your time and your talent without, you don't have to pay the money, but you got to show up, got to play the songs, you got to, you got to network, you got to talk to people, collect emails and then invite them to your show. Yeah. And, and it's going to be a lot more successful than, you know, putting out flyers of, you know, people don't know who the heck you are, right? If oh, you've it's... gone to an open mic, they're like, oh, I've just connected with you over your music and you've been 10 feet away from me. And, you know, and, and you've got that real connection. And then, you you know, and all the music's online. So you immediately go and back and you you start, you digest and, and ingest all the uh, great music that, from the artist. And then what do the people do? They share it. Yep. Hey, I, hey, you want to go? I, I met this girl and she's got this insane I mean, of the voice, Angelic. Oh my God, her songs are amazing. She's playing Eddie's Thursday. I want to go. You guys can come with me. Next thing you know, you, you meet one person and they bring 10 people and they all become fans. It's probably in the, in the world of sales, the best, absolute best, bar none way to sales. You say, oh, is it telemarketing? Is it commercials? No, it's one on one. Yep. Shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye, and tell them why your product's good, right? But you can't do that. If you're selling Coca-Cola, you can't walk around to everybody and say, you know what, you should try one of these. I mean, you, you, you die of old age before you get 100,000 people. So, but in, in this world where it, we're, we're overloaded sensory and so much music and, you know, it's, it's just coming out of nowhere. If you can find a way where that one touch point could mushroom out into many, I think, I think open mics are definitely... The way to go and i also think that you know uh, real music festivals you know not the micro music festival obviously yeah the open mic but um you know the bigger music festivals they they if you're unknown or whatever they don't pay anything or they don't pay well um but still that that you know the whole exposure gig 
Um, that's a real exposure gig, I think, playing a festival and, and getting out there in front of a lot of people because you do, you'll have merch and you 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 be promoting your website and your music. And and that that would be a way to, you know, get some traction, excuse me, for your music. And and that's what it's all about, is is get people to hear it and then and then give them an action point, a way to connect with you online and become real followers and real fans. Yeah. I mean, good marketing is going to cost you. It's either going to cost you money or it's going to cost you time. And like you said, and especially when you're first starting out, it's worth it. The one on one is what's really going to bring you the super fans. So that makes a lot of sense. Now, I know that you um, actually help musicians go as we were talking about cover songs, go from, you know, starting out doing these open mics and things tend to actually go out and become a cover musician and do that as a career making money. Uh, doing cover gigs all over town. How do you how do you get people from one to the other? This is something that didn't uh, require me to go to school on, other than the school of life. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the poster child for that for the journey. So uh, I mentioned I was going to this this open mic, and I came back and I said, "Oh, it, it ended," and I started another open mic. And then somewhere in there, it occurred to me that I could actually play out. It, 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 I think it was the, the the bar where I was doing the open mic said, oh, you know, can you play? Do you have a band? I'm like, well, yeah, I know like all these guys from the open mic. Sure. Yeah, I have a band. It's like, OK, well, we need somebody Friday night. Can you play? I'm like, yeah, I can play. Next thing you know, I've got a paid gig in a bar and a band. All right. Wow. By accident. I just stumbled forward. The opportunities found me. And I like to say, you know, if I could give advice to to anybody ever anywhere that I meet is head on a swivel. When you drive, if you drive looking straight ahead, you're going to get hit by the guy coming from the side, right? Look to the side, look to the side, right? It's common sense. Do that all the time, physically and mentally, right? Have your antenna up, head on a swivel, looking around for opportunities, whether it's your musician, you're looking for, you know, the the next uh, gig or, you know, networking. That's what that's what networking is, right? Have a head on a swivel. So anyway, I, I went and I, uh, you know, had a swivel, you know, hey, you could play here. And I'm like, oh, ding, maybe I can do more with this. Like the open mic thing. I was running an open mic. I got fired. I got three open mics. And I'm like, wow, I never thought of that before. But maybe open mics can be a business, right? Maybe I can make a living in the open mic world like nobody else does, but maybe I can. So <laughs> I'm the guy with the arrows in the back. They call me a pioneer. So I started playing out and then I, and I started, uh, I, I found a guy playing in a, a Mexican restaurant and I asked him, how do you get this gig? He says, oh, I, I work with this agent. I go, so he gives me the number and I called the guy and he goes, oh yeah, you know, you, um, you know, I, I, I book like 40 Mexican restaurants all over uh, Atlanta. Wow. Okay. Well, how much is it? You know, how much do you pay? He says, well, uh, it's a hundred bucks and you go in for three hours and you get, um, you, you get a, a, a speedy to eat. Speedy, what's it? It's like, well, that's that's the uh, the tacos, uh, an an enchilada, and rice and beans. (laughs) I said, oh, you got it down to to what I'm going to eat. Okay, all right, whatever sounds like gold to me. So I get I get to eat, uh, you know, something I wouldn't normally eat, and a hundred bucks, and then I got to give him ten dollars for for booking. But the guy had me booked all the time, Mm -hmm. and. He turned out to be a real ass. So um, <laughs> I was on the taco tour and I, uh, I got off the taco tour and I started figuring out how to get better gigs in this. And, and so and, and, and then uh, equipment. Oh, my God. I had the worst equipment. I, I had a, a Fender uh, PA and it was really made for just like uh, use at a school, like if the teachers were talking to kids or mm. something. But it was all in one and it was cheap. And, it, you know, and I put the two little speakers out. And it was awful. And then, then I, you know, I, I figured out, oh, I see a big powered speaker. That'd be nice, you know. And then I changed my sound. And so I made all the mistakes, but I always stumbled forward. And so now I get the highest paying gigs in town. I'm very select. I, I literally, I have a gig tonight. Um, and people hear this and like, really? You do that? So, yeah, for 10 years. I put my gear on a, a golf cart. And I ride down the backyard and get on, put the gear on my pontoon boat. And then I ride 20 minutes over to the floating bar. And then I play and then they give me $300 and a, and a tab. And then I make $100 in tips. And then I get a drink and a cigar and I slowly ride home. Best commute ever. 
via boat. Now, anybody as a musician, professional musician has had, you know, the loadouts from hell where you have to, you know, go downstairs or go upstairs, you know, it, 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 it you know, they pay a hundred dollars a man, you know, since the seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I've, I've cracked the code on how to get good gigs, how to put on a professional uh, performance cover songs. And um, I even play probably for the last 10, 12 years um, in the Caribbean. Mm. So I, uh, my wife and I go for free uh, to all inclusive resorts and I play for one hour and I get Saturdays off. So I have a six hour work week and we both get, a, you know, a five star vacation. Uh, <laughs> people are like, you do that? I'm like, yep. And I go to gigs on my boat. Right. So if you want to do what I do, you might want to consider taking a course called Performer Pro, because what I do, the, the, the course is not going to everything in the course is not going to be an epiphany like brand new. But when you put it together, it's a very logical thing. You, you everybody's got a different jump off point, different starting point. So a lot of the things we go over, the basic thing, I'm assuming that you can sing and you can play. You've got a repertoire, um, something to, to, to start with. Right. I'm not going to teach you how to play guitar, teach you how to sing. But um, I, I do answer the question. A lot of the, the, the biggest question a lot of amateurs have is like, well, I play at the open mic, but, you know, am I good enough to get a paid gig? And even without hearing you play a note, I say yes. And the, and the reason I can do that is that you live someplace. I assume you live in a populated area, not in northern Montana. And you like you know, and, and you have a town and there's restaurants and bars, and you have a sphere of friends, maybe you're on a tennis team, you go to church, whatever. You have people that personally like you and support you. And you could go to those people and say, Hey, I've got a paid gig at McNally's on Saturday night. I'm gonna be up there playing music for three hours. Will you come support me? And if you can do that, you can get the gig at McNally's. And what you do is you ask all those people in advance, hey, if I get a gig at one of these local places, will you come support me? And then you make a note and you're like, I think I've got 20 people that'll actually come out and have dinner and drinks. And that will cover your cost plus some profit. It'll put butts in seats. And that's the marketable thing. It, you're not marketing whether or not you're good. You're marketing whether or not you can bring in enough people to justify the cost, right? You're selling beer. And that's how I know you're good enough. Now, are you good enough to get the gig at the floating bar? Because I, I frankly don't bring anybody out to this gig. 10 years. I mean, I do. I bring <laughs> family and friends. They come out and they're like, oh, Graver's playing. And I actually cultivated a number of people on the lake that, that like to hear me. So, but the reality is, is they, people come there because they know they have high quality musicians. Right. Like, oh, who's playing? I don't know. Let's just go to Pete's, right? Mm. So it, 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 you you do need to be, you, you need to up your game. You need to level up if you're going to do that. But you you can start and say, you, you know, and once you get paid, you're a professional. That's it. All you got to do is get paid to play one time and you're a professional musician. So um, this course is called Performer Pro and it's performerpro.net is the website. And the nice thing is I've, um, I have a pithy little book that really will give you the, the jump off point and, 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 um, to, to go from amateur to professional, it's called make music, make money. And you can sign up on that website to get that, uh, free download. It's PDF and it'll just be emailed to you and that's it. There's no cost, no nothing. You can read it. I think, uh, people have told me they read it in under an hour and, uh, I've had people say it changed their life and launched their career and, and they're making a lot of money playing cover gigs. Other people read that and go, yeah, I want to deep dive on this guy. <laughs> I, I like what he does. I really want to be him. I want I want the roadmap. I want him talking to me. Um, the course comes with, you know, one on one coaching, you know, questions, answers during the course, uh, you know, personal gear recommendations. And then uh, if you take the course. I actually, you know, it really comes down to uh, what level, what stage you're at quality wise. But um, for those that rise up and are of good quality, I actually put them into the uh, the Caribbean uh, mm -hmm. gig uh, loop. So I, I put them right with the booking agent for the Caribbean uh, gigs.
And, that's uh, very, very cool. Wow, that's if, awesome. If, nice connection. If, if, if nothing else, that one thing, and people like people allow me to kill, like, how do I get a gig in the current? Like, yeah, I'm, in December, I'm going to Punta Cana. Uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've Decembered <laughs> in um, Turks and Caicos eight years in a row, spent the whole mm-hmm. month, five weeks at, at, you know, one of the most expensive, exclusive islands in the Caribbean. So nice. So performerpro.net is how they find that, right? Yeah, performerpro.net. Yeah. Awesome. Now we have just a couple minutes left, but I want to make sure that you mention about the nonprofit organization that you work with because it's it's very cool. Thanks, Bree. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is near and dear to my heart. April uh, Brooks uh, Brooks called me one day, and she used to be a, a host for me. And she says, "Dave, I'm starting this organization. Um, all right, and and I, I just you know I I know you're a good business guy. I was just hoping maybe you could give me some advice." And it, it took about 10 minutes. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm in. She goes, well, do you want to be on the board? Yep. Yep. I'm in. <laughs> it's called uh, Amped Kids. So A-M-P-E-D, ampedkids.org. And we've been six, seven years now. And what we do is we do fundraising to um, uh, support paying for music lessons and instruments for kids in the foster care system. And the, the, the reason this is so important is, is music is, is transformational. It changes lives and changing the life of a child that's <clears throat> unfortunate enough to find themselves in the, in the foster care system, which means their, their parents are either um, deceased or unfit to be parents. Um, and they've been taken from their parents uh, and placed into a system and they're being raised by strangers. And many of the strangers are, are wonderful and, and they become their official foster parents. Some kids never get a permanent home. They live in a foster care home. They live temporarily. And music uh, for those kids gives them something to use as, as uh, to express themselves. Um, we, we actually have uh, songwriting workshops, which mm-hmm. I, I do a number of those teaching basics on, on songwriting. And boy, watch these kids come alive. You know, they, they in this in that workshop, they write a song, their first song, and they're wow. like, "Oh!" Next thing you know, um, can we? Can we what do I have to do to take guitar lessons? I said, "You don't have to do anything. Just let me know. You 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 just you did it. You just told me, and we'll we'll take care of it. And all the lessons are free. We pay all the instructors full rate, right? So we don't ask instructors to donate their time. Um, in you know, some instances, they they want to and they do extra things for us, but." And then we we have to um, purchase guitars and and keyboards, and we we actually will pay uh, if if a student wants to be in a in the, uh, the school band. We we'll, a lot of times there's there's cost to every kid. The, the parents are supposed to pony up a couple hundred dollars or whatever it is just to be in the band to cover instrument costs and things like that. We'll do that. So we're we're very flexible on what we do with the, the funds, but it's all directly at the kids um, and directly at uh, music education for the kids and some of the most needy kids um, in our society. And so you know, we've seen it, Trent, you know, in, in the seven years, we, we've seen kids go, you know, from, you know, there were, a lot of the kids are in trouble. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're into drugs, they're, they're, they're criminals, they're, you know, and they, they end up in the system and they, they, they find music and it changes their lives and puts them on a path. So instead of dropping out of school and becoming a problem to society, kids that come into our system, bring music into their life, graduate school, go on to college and become productive members mm-hmm. of society. If we can do that once, great. But if we can do it, you know, a thousand times, it moves the needle in the, in this arena and in a, in a, in a space that's desperate for people to care. And so um, if anybody wants to help out and, and donate, just ampedkids.org. You just go on there and, and there's a donate button and just anything, $5, $5,000, whatever it is. <laughs> and we also accept uh, uh, donated uh, instruments. Um, also, we work with um, Guitars for Kids out of uh, Oregon and um, another fantastic organization. They go to the guitar manufacturers. We did a thing with them in Nashville uh, at the Gibson Guitar Plant. And Gibson gave away 200 brand new guitars. And, and I think we got like uh, 11 of those for our kids here in Georgia. Wow, but we, that's we, incredible. We actually, yeah, and we're operating in Georgia and in Tennessee. 
And we just teamed up with a company through our connection at Guitars for Kids that actually has taken over and running the um, the foster care system for states. Mm-hmm. So they're, I think they're in Oregon. I think they're taking over Tennessee um, and I think Arkansas. And so they love what we're doing automatically. And part of our trouble is getting into the states and convincing them that what we do is worth their mm-hmm. time because it, maybe they don't understand the value of music. And, and, and so we have to bring them up to speed. Working with this company, is it's you know, the second that they turn on the lights, they call us and say, get over here and start this. So we're using, we're going to work with them to, to march across the country. So um, I'll, I'll, and, and 100% of the money, 100% of the money that comes in um, goes right back into uh, the lessons and the kids. I'm, I'm a volunteer. Our founder, uh, April, still is a volunteer. She's a real estate agent to make money and, and she volunteers. And we have a number of people on the board that all volunteer. So um, just that's know that- That's amazing. So that's, that's ampedkids.org? Yes, ma'am. Ampkids.org. You guys go check that out. That is such a cool, especially if you're in, in Nashville area or Atlanta area, um, such a great organization. David, I want to thank you so much. You've shared so much great stuff today. I really appreciate you sharing, you know, kind of those backstage secrets and stuff. And I really want to encourage everybody to go check out all the resources. We'll have them in the show notes. And again, thank you, David, so much for everything that you shared with us today and giving us your time. Bree, thank you. And I appreciate you having the podcast of all podcasts. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.